Okay, so uh, welcome again to, thank you, uh, welcome again to the practical class in discrete math. So it's the third practical class and we'll start with uh, the following um, uh, question which actually came from the first class, which is about um, uh, the uh, non-polynomiality of uh, uh, resolution for three sat. So the question was as follows. So you have a three sad problem. And the question was to construct three CNF uh, with uh, exponential blow up under resolution. So and I will ask uh, the physical class here, also maybe the people on Zoom. Uh, did anyone arrive at an answer? It was an exercise. It was a, the last exercise of the first class. First class. First class two, two years, two weeks ago. Yeah, so the exercise was formulated as follows. You have to find, no, well, it was parameterized by a natural number, so we have to find a uh, Actually, a series of uh, formulae in 3CNF, which gives financial blow. But if nobody did this, I will do it by myself because it's an important. Uh -huh. you, you want to show, yeah? I, I have a suspicion, but I have absolutely no idea how to rigorously prove that it blows up. Okay. okay. Uh, Step forward, we'll, we'll discuss it. So, the idea of the seminary is just that it should be interactive. People should try their own idea. Not a lecture where I just use the I can almost say nothing except the formula that I came up with is that. Yeah, with the M formula, okay, great. C and L. There's a big conjunction, okay. Okay, and I have, an attempt, I have an attempt to make uh, an exhaustive resolution on my own for the first uh, couples of N, and it seems to grow very fast, and I have a conspiracy that this trend remains as N goes to infinity. Okay, but let's try, okay, this is, <laughs> thank you. So you, you gave me an actual, oh, yeah, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Yeah. You, you write negation that way, right? Yes, yeah. this is the other way for negation. All, already three times. Okay. It's really, yeah, yeah. So we were, well, this one is the usual thing in logic. So we replace it with child in the programming assignment because there's no way of doing this in ASCII. And this is just a shorthand because you want, you want both literals to be of the same length. Yeah. So actually, you gave me <laughs> quite a uh, an interesting task to analyze your example because I had another example which uh, was easy to prove that it is exponential but this is another one we should discuss actually and uh, how can we will try to uh, give exhausting resolution and let's see what's going on so what what was going to happen so okay we shall have a for example, let's start it with A1 with the negation or A2 or A3. This is the first one. The second one is going to be A2 with the negation or A3 or A4. And even without going further, we can apply a resolution and resolving this against this will give us what? It will remove this and will give you A1 bar or A3 or A4. But this is not that interesting because um, what happened now? It just it just uh, put the, the next two guys here, yeah. So what happens next? Next you will have a three or a four or a five, right? So again, you can resolve this against this, and you will get what? You will get a one or a four or a5. So by resolving just in this way, you will get 
I will write, try to use another marker. So these guys are open. So I will write this. Write this in blue. And this is a bad idea. So I'm going to use the same one. Uh, so what can we add here? We can add a1 or a i, a j, I don't know, or a j plus one. There is still a possibility to resolve the second yes, step yes. to the third one. Yes, yes, yes. So this is this is just the first step. Um, um, so yeah, now you can resolve. What do what do you want to resolve now? You want to resolve. What, this again is no. This is not possible. No, the second with the third in the main column. Yes. Second with the third. Yes. Yeah. So you can also get what what will we get? Now you will get. You will get a uh, this was this a two bar or a four or a five yeah okay so actually what will you, you will get and again you can proceed further right yes so what you will get you will get arbitrary a i here with the negation or a j or a j plus one so these are going to be there but this is still uh, not an exponential blow up. Why? Because the length of your clauses doesn't grow. And if you have only three uh, elements in your clause, then the size of your thinnet will be cubic. Well, it, it, it does grow because now we can reduce yeah. the last one with the first one. And now you will get a not a one or a three or a four or a five. Not a one or a two or a no, four or a, not, not two, a, a three. Three or four or five. So, okay, how can you uh, formalize it? So, you can uh, having, uh, so you will have, say, A1 or these guys. So, what can you do? You can uh, have, okay, let me uh, remove the first one. So, I think I will, I've grasped the idea how to, how to do this. So, uh, what can you have? You can have not A1. Or a two, or I don't know what can you have else. Okay, or a two or a three. Um, now you can uh, have not a two or a three or a four. So this means that you will get. Not a one or a. Okay, yeah, this is what we already did. So we, what what we do have is that we have not a one or a i or a i plus one. Now we have a i or I don't know a or a j plus one. So you will have not a one or a i plus one or or a j or a j plus one, right? Or you even can do this. You can put a i plus one here, and you will you can put so your i plus one. So you will have an a. Well, I think I don't know whether this is doable if j is less than i. So let's put the j greater than. So now what can we do next? We can take a j plus one with negation or a k or a k plus one. So this is, as we know, this should be provable, yep. So if they're bigger than this, they're provable, yep. Right? So what can we do next? Okay, we resolve this against this and we get a not a one or a i or a j or a k or a k plus one, right? So in second one, we don't put no a, no, hmm? yes. Uh, why we don't put uh, a i or a i plus one or a j plus one? Because it's just... No, no, it looks like that. 
So uh, they, how do, how, what, what did we do? We, we proved all the formulae of this sort, but also we could do the same with A2 instead of A1. Because, well, we can just start with A2 and get anything, well, but J should be, uh, we can do the same with A plus one, but J should be greater, should be the first. Maybe we could do it also with smaller ones we just didn't check it. But the idea is that we can actually, when we perform all this stuff, well, unfortunately, I have to. Yeah, I think I can write also somewhere here. So what we can put, we can start with A1 with negation. It's the first one. Then we start with A I1 or A I2, etc. A I N. So um, this is what we can get really here, right? And the only constraint is that i with the index m is should be great m plus one should be greater than i m plus one. And now we have to compute which is the possible yeah and i one should be greater than, I don't know, one, right? And now one just has to compute, it's just combinatorics. How many um, tuples of possible uh, I1, In are available? Well, it's better to write N, let's write L here, because N is the number of variables. Well, let's calculate. So, um, well, it's, uh, the idea is as follows. So what is, what happens now? So we take this long line. And so this is from one to N. And now we have to uh, find out where these guys sit. So the first one, I one, should be greater than one. So this at least one item here, right? Then this is I1, this is at least one item here, which is I1 plus one, which we cannot use. Now we have to put I2 here, then again this, etc. And here we'll put um, I L. So suppose that L is roughly equivalent to, I don't know, N divided by two, or even N divided by three for being No, each no, n divided by n. So just just to have space in order to have many variants. So if we take just say n divided by three, we'll, or the n divided by two would be bad because there's the only way of doing this is just by just by interest. Let's take n divided by ten, just for for confidence. Okay. So uh, now what is going on? We have to actually. What we have to do is just, um, we can actually remove these unnecessary guys because, and also nth is bad because uh, taking nth means that you will not have L plus one, which is not possible. So uh, this means that we take n, we remove these which cannot be used. So we remove L plus one. And now, we can actually choose arbitrary elements for these points, right? We just uh, suppose, uh, suppose that these are just balls lying in a row. We say remove the first ball. Uh, we, uh, so, okay, we, we can do like that. We can just say that we are trying to guess the lengths of these intervals. The first one, zeroth one, the first one, the second, and the end. Yeah, so this length of the interval should be at least one. So we can subtract the unit from the length of each interval, so it can be zero. So it means that it's just putting the borders between these intervals. And there are this many balls, and we have to color L balls with, say, black, and that will be one. So the answer will be this. Or in the Soviet notation, 
and we'll do this. Okay, and now we have a compute. So this looks like an exponent, but we have to be confident about that. So this is going to be, a, okay, let me rotate my webcam not to see this for a uh, So uh, this is going to be n plus, n minus, sorry. n plus one factorial divided by n. Oh, no, no, yeah, divided by, okay, how to write this, okay, l factorial. Yeah, it will be l factorial multiplied by n minus 2l plus 1 factorial. Okay, so um, what's going on? So recall that l is n divided by 10. So this means that l factorial, so we have to write it like this, yeah, greater or equal because uh, we have to use the low, we have to compute the lower bound. We're at greater or equal, so L factorial is, so it should, this should be lesser or equal, right? So uh, this is definitely lesser or equal than L to the power of L, right? So which is N divided by 10 to the power of N divided by 10. So again, n minus 2l plus 1, a factorial, is less or equal than, than what? It's less or equal than, well, it's less or equal than l minus 2l factorial, right? Because this is just bigger. And this is less or equal than um, 2l is, so 2l is n to the 4n divided by 5, right? because this is n divided by 5 in the power of 4n divided by 5. And now greater or equal. So this guy should be greater or equal than, uh, than what? Then I don't know, 2 to the power of n minus l minus 2, right? Because, well, what is here? It's one, divide, 1 by 2 by 3 by etc. So starting with 2, all these guys are greater or equal than 2. So there are that many guys here who are greater or equal than 2. So just a rough idea. It should be divided by what? So it should be divided by n, so multiplied by 10 to the power of n divided by 10, right? multiplied by 5 to the power of 4n divided by 5. And here you will have these beasts. You will have this. Yeah, unfortunately, I think here will, I uh, yeah, will fail by now because this will be n not in power of 10 divided by 10 and 4n in power of 4n divided by 5. And unfortunately, I think that this guy unfortunately grows faster than this one. Right? So this is not that good. We have to use some more clever asymptotic for the factorial here, unfortunately. So, um, because here, this is going to be faster because this is that. And what is the asymptotic for? Can we, um, let's see. Um, Yeah, so here we should do something more clever. It should be greater or equal than remove this guy and write a Stirling formula, which says it should be n. So n minus l plus one is roughly speaking, I don't know, it's n divided, nine n divided by 10. 
I should divide it by E also and put it into this power of 9 and divide it by 10. And so this is 30. We just skip the square root. Greater or equal. We have removed, yes, there should be square root of 2 pi n also, but removed because uh, we're doing it lower bound. And now, well, it looks like it, it got, because here you will have, um, so what we'll have here, for n you will have something like n to which power? Uh, to the power of 9n divided by 10 minus n divided by 10 minus 4n divided by 5. And I, fortunately, I think, no, I think that this, so it's n divided by 10 here, mm, it's going to be 8n divided, oh, it's g zero, this is bad. But I think, yeah, we should also, if we compute this more thoroughly, we'll get something nice. But as you see here, the, I, I hope that if we put the correct n l here, we will get something good, but the computation is quite hard here. So it seems that this should be exponential, just intuitively. And actually, I think that you could uh, you could make it. A, by the way, you uh, you could make it even bigger because um, yeah, I think you could also play with these guys with all this stuff here. But um, uh, you actually, L should not be fixed. L is arbitrary. So it's the idea is that, so this is all well, it's all very mm, hard, hard to understand really. But the idea is quite uh, natural in this stuff. So the idea was that we uh, obtained guys like this, which uh, are roughly speaking subsets of numbers from one to n. So here we had also these fatty constraints which we couldn't overcome. But maybe we could, in a sense, do this. I, I don't really, uh, yeah, I, th I think the idea of what we could do is as follows, that um, if we remove all this stuff and uh, what we really needed is a formula of this form, a i negation disjunction a j disjunction a j plus one. So we managed to do this for j greater than i plus 1. If we manage to do this for j less than i plus 1, we'll just get virtually arbitrary subsets of numbers from 1 to n. And this will do the job. Right? Let's try to do this. I hope we could do this. So, okay, if we take this and... Uh, no, I don't know how to do this. Maybe there could be a trick. We could, we could do a trick. We could add the following. Okay, let's add also these guys. Just add them into our original CNF. I don't know whether they are derivable, but if we add them, this will just make it twice bigger, right? If we add these guys to the CNF, we could also do this for J, which are less than i plus one, uh, less than i minus one. And also maybe we could do this. So this will give us arbitrary triples of the form a i with bar, a j, a j plus one. Except for trivial cases where this say okay, but if this is just AI, this is trivially trivialized. And then if we do resolutions with these guys, we'll, what we will get? We'll get this, the AI, AJ, AK, AK plus one, as we did already, yeah? I will rotate my... So, okay, if we, uh, we take A1 and or AI or AI plus one, here i is just greater than one. Then we take a i plus one disjunction a j disjunction a j plus one 
and the result will get removed this remove aj aj plus one etc etc and we get the necessary result that will uh, when we saturate we'll get a i then a j then a j a k a k plus one and these i j k they are going to be arbitrary the only thing that they should not be n in order to not to clash with the and there and there should not be one you know to not to clash in this in here and this is this does the job because this means that here you can include any non-empty subset of the numbers from two to n minus one so the total number of rows will greater or equal than two n minus two minus one which is just the empty one this is the desired experiment. So this is a small modification of this construction which does the job. Yeah? So sorry for this long uh, exercise, but even so this is the answer. So here is the answer. And uh, okay, there's a question here. Yeah, please move to the left here. Yeah, I, I did this, sorry. Um, uh, okay, so this is uh, the answer and the idea which I wanted you to take from this that computation is that if you have a three CNF, then when you do resolution, your clauses can grow up and when they grow, you will have, uh, you can have exponentially many possibilities because for example, you can implement all the subsets of a given set of variables. It can be done like that, it can be done in another way, but you can do this, and while you can do this, it means that you you uh, go exponentially. And your CNF could be satisfiable, it could be not satisfiable, you can run to a, an empty clause at this point, but when you say saturate, you will get exponential flow up. And as we show in the lectures, it will be inevitable. Okay, so this ends our discussion of uh, the, this problem. Now we have to move to First order predicate logic, the exercises on that. So again, as we are running out of time, well, drastically, so let us look at the problems and uh, maybe you could ask in the class and maybe also in the Zoom chats, um, what should we discuss now from this second exercise sheet? What, what do we want to discuss? Okay, if, if we don't have any preferences, then I think from each exercise we'll try maybe one or two points. So from exercise number one, we're talking about general truth. So let's take one E. This is a funny formula and uh, we'll talk about that. So in one E, it is important that our um, domain is non-empty. So the problem, uh, this is like that. It says that there exists an X such that if D of X is true, then for, then for all Y, D of Y. So before proceeding, we'll uh, I would say a funny formal meaning of the formula and why it's called D, so it's called Trinker formula. And uh, it says as follows, so our domain is a bar. There are some people in the bar and um, D of X means that X drinks right now. And this formula says that there exists a guy that if he drinks, then other, all other people, all people drink. So this looks like something controversial and uh, it's if you understand that is something like intention so that people really look at this guy and uh, start drinking after him that this should not be always true. But classically this is a tautology, well not a tautology but it's called generally true formula. So does anyone want to justify it? 
Okay, let me do this. So um, this is the formula which, okay, let's do classical reasoning. So in classical logic, you have P or not P. You have either something is true or something is false. We have two cases. So case one, there exists an X such that it, this guy doesn't drink. What happens then? Okay, no, 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 not, no, no, not like this. So there exists a guy, yeah, who doesn't drink, yeah. So then, for this very x, you will have that d of x implies for all y d of y. Why? Well, just because this is zero. And z so this is let's call this guy x zero. So if there is a server guy, then uh, g of x zero is false. And this d of x zero imp implies anything. That's by x files equal limit. And uh, therefore, you, since this guy exists, you can write like this, and you justify the formula. So case two, suppose this is not the case. What does that mean? That means that any guy drinks. But then, of course, you will have this. Because an implication with a um, true conclusion is always true. A typical classical reasoning, you consider two cases. Well, either something is true or is false. In no classical logic, this is invalid, by the way, but we're not studying no classical logics here, so just enjoy your classical reasoning. Okay, for other problems here, I think it's uh, so you could also think about two, number one, D. That just let, that's a brief note for all x exists y such that something 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 implies exists y that for all x r or something something something. How do you think? Is this generally true or not? No. no? Why? No. I mean, if there is, uh, uh, how, how should they explain there? I mean, uh, if, uh, if for any x there is such a y that uh, are, are um, of a slight true, it doesn't mean that there is such a y that uh, it would be in this relation with any x. Yes, yes. So uh, now we so should, yeah. Point. So this says that for any x there exists a particular y, but this says there should be one y for all x, say one ring true of them all. This is r for ring, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm, now, formally speaking, if you try to falsify something, you need to satisfy its negation. So you have to uh, find out a counter model and unsatisfying assignment. Well, how can you see this? Okay, there are many examples. You need to find a situation where there exists a specific y for each x, but not all y for all x. So maybe one of the interesting things is you can say the set of say natural numbers and your relation R of x, y is that x is say great less than y or greater or less because natural numbers. so again for each x there exists a y which is greater right but there is no y which is greater than all than all natural numbers you can even put that less or equal here so with less this is impossible because nothing is less than itself for example but even here there is no maximal natural number. So there's no natural number which is greater or equal than all of natural numbers. But for each number, there is something which is greater or equal than it itself, for example, or it's of one. So this is an important thing. And by the way, before going further, I would like to say a funny story about that. So uh, this formula, it's not generally true. Uh, it implements the difference in calculus and mathematical analysis between the notion of just, I don't know, continuity of a function and uniform continuity. So a function is continuous, though, you know, for all and so on, there exists a delta such that, such that, such that. And if it happens for all x, then this uh, function is continuous in every part. So there could be a stronger thing that uh, for all epsilon, there exists a delta such that uh, for any x, Um, for any x, the uh, condition holds. So it means that your deltas are uniform with respect to this point. 
And this is a quite subtle difference because there's a difference in the order of quantifiers. If you write it in the formal way in language of mathematical logic, of course, it's, it's a visible difference. But if you do this in the sense of, uh, as usual in old calculus books, just in words, that's very easy to miss this difference. And actually, the guy who missed it was uh, quite a famous mathematician, Cauchy, who uh, made an incorrect statement just by mixing the notions of usual pointwise continuity and uh, uniform continuity. And uh, this motivated him and uh, furthermore uh, Karl Verstas for uh, formalizing mathematical analysis and uh, bringing it up to the modern standards of uh, logical rigor and using the quantifiers which were introduced in this form, I think, by Russell, but of course, uh, Mayer Strauss already understood that. So this is a, a thing why people should use logical symbols in order not to confuse uh, notions which are intrinsically different, but which uh, in quantifiers have a very small formal difference. This is very important to be accurate. So, okay, let's go further. So the second task is purely it's what about satisfiability. Okay, let's see, 2A, is it satisfiable? Yeah. One, if people want to do 1c, I think we'll do it after 2. Let's do it first, do 2 and then to 1c. Okay, so, um, okay, 2a, is it satisfiable? No. Exists x that for all y, q of xx and not q of xy. No. It's not satisfiable because if you have for all y not q of x y, you have not q of x x, and it's not satisfiable. The next one, there exists x and y, there's p of x and not p of y. This is of course satisfiable. They take natural numbers and even odd, something like that. And to c, well, it looks like it should be satisfiable just by definition that for all there exists an x that for all y, if q of x y, then something about r. You can make Q just four and you're satisfied. Okay, people ask for one C from the chat. So, well, let's do it. Unfortunately, we have to do it. So, yeah, one C. So, it, it looks scary. I think we can do it. So for all x, p of x implies q of x, and doesn't exist x, q of x, then for all y, not p of y. So okay, what is the bold guess? Is it generally true or not? It should be generally true, yeah. So how do we justify implication? We have to suppose that the, that the premise is true and prove the uh, conclusion, right? Because if the premise is false, we are done. We already win. But we suppose that this And also this. Well, we have a conjunction and we can just split it into two, right? So suppose this. And now we have to prove for all y, not p of y. So take an arbitrary y. And now we can um, go by uh, contraposition. So we have to prove not p of y. So suppose. P of y. We want to get a contradiction. Suppose P of y, now we have the general statement that P of x implies Q of x, then we will get Q of y. And now this means that we have like this x Q of x. And this contradiction. Yeah, so how, how is that Q of y? 
Oh, we get the plural x. We have p of x implies p of x. In particular, we have p of y implies p of y. Okay. Okay, number three. Do you want number three? So this is a long formula. Well, about number three. Well, let's uh, think about number three as a uh, so let's think about Q as a relation. So what does it say here? What does the first one say? It says that for each X, there is an element which is in this relation, we say greater than X, right? And what does the second element of the conjunction say? How do you think? For all X, not QXX. What does it say about the relation called Q? It's a reflexive here. No, no element is in the relation with itself. And what does the second say? It would take any three arbitrary elements mm -hmm. in our domain, at least one, if the true. No, no, no. The third. <laughs> if q of x, y, and q of y, z, then q of x, z. It's transitivity, yeah. It says that if, if x is less than y and y is less than z, then x is less than z. Yeah. So actually, this stuff says that this is a q is a transitive, irreflexive relation, and each element is in this relation with some other. So can you satisfy this on an infinite domain? Of course, yes. And the answer is actually the natural numbers, for example, where Q is, inter is uh, interpreted as strict inequality, right? Mm -hmm. So what does it mean? It means that uh, Q of X, Y means that X is just less than Y as a natural number. Okay, but can you... Uh, Make such a relation on a finite set. How do you think? Suppose you have a finite set. What does that mean? It means that you will have an element called x zero. Recall that the domain should be always non-empty. You always have at least one element, like in the primitive form. Then it should be in a relation q with some element x1, which is that y here. Uh, can x1 be the same as x0? Well, the answer is no, because it's irreflexive. So now you will have a greater element x2 as term. And I claim that all these elements are distinct. Because suppose that xi plus 1, xi is in the relation q with some xj, where j is greater than i. Oh, okay, no. Uh, suppose no, this is more than that. So well, let's remove this. So, uh, yeah, so remove this. So uh, so we, we always have q of xi xj for j greater than i, right? Because uh, by transitivity, i is in relation with i plus one, then i plus two, i plus three, and up to ij, uh, up to j. So ij are in the relation, by transitivity. But this means that xi cannot be the same as xj, because we'll have, we have this property that not q of xx. So therefore, all these elements are distinct. In our model, right? Because the strict inequality, it's just it's irreflexive. So uh, x i cannot be the same as the next one x i plus one, and is transitive, so it could not be the same as something else. So we have an infinite countable chain of different elements, They're all different. Therefore, the model should be infinite. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, so okay, this is, um, we've finished with uh, task number three. So task number four. On natural numbers, we should implement uh, the um, uh, next element now, next element function, using the uh, uh, order, the strict order. How do you do this? How do you write that u equals, how do I say, u equals u plus one, yes? V equals u plus one. If your only predicate symbol is less on natural numbers. Okay. And the second one since uh, we is u plus one means there is no number in between of them uh, it cannot be so there doesn't exist an x such that uh, r of u and x and uh, r of x and u so it means that there is no natural number no natural number in between yep yeah. this is the correct answer and uh, this is going to be uh, valid on natural, also valid on integers, just the same. The negatives are okay here. But on reals or rationals, this is bad. Because, well, there will always be something in between. And actually, you cannot express u plus one using uh, uh, only order on, say, real numbers. And the reason is scaling. You can rescale your model and you will keep your ordering you can stretch it for example two times or you can uh, make it smaller and you will keep your order but you will uh, fail to uh, maintain this plus one because it will become plus two or plus one plus two. okay i hope i think that the last two questions will be left for one more week for you because we need to introduce the new assignment for today and have to discuss it at least a bit of that because it's quite uh quite substantial actually okay so these are the old ones okay these are the new ones um so please yeah so this is the old one okay please uh handle this out and I will put the link to the chat also in the zoom and um, this is the, the next Next exercise. So, um, okay. Uh -huh. So it's called Turing machine and graphs, and uh, and this is going to be. Mm -hmm. Chat. Um, yeah, people ask about the previous questions. First, I will put the thing in the chat, and then um, home task 2.4 R of UV and R of UV plus 2. Um, why should we do that? Yes, I think you. Yes, I think you can do this. Yes, this also correct. Okay, let's go to Turing machines. So um, we had. The, yeah. So we uh, here it's a twofold task. So we'll uh, discuss a bit of Turing machines now, and uh, for graphs, I will just give a small introduction, and we'll. Um, uh, leave it for the next time. So, um, uh, okay. So, uh, the first part, well, we tried to make it as a bit uh, not that hard, but please forgive that this could be a bit of programming in a strange programming language just to get an understanding of what happens. And uh, now we have to think about constructing these Turing machines. So, the Turing machine will be one tape. And uh, now we, um, let's try, well, one A and one B. I think we'll do this now. And everything else is going to be your home task. Well, it's, 
it, it is actually easier than 1b. So you will be okay with that. So first 1a, you have... Uh, so do I understand correctly that to construct a deterministic Turing machine needs to provide a table for the for the transition? For the transitions, yes, for the transitions. It's, uh, well, it's uh, a tape machine with, uh, uh, yeah, it's a machine, find a machine with a tape. So, well, you can write it as a transition table as we do it here, and also you can write it as a graph, just by error. Yeah. So, okay, the first and the easiest task, how to add a unit to, um, to a number in unary notation. So, unary notation is just a sequence of one. So we have one, 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 one. And this is our tree. <clears throat> so here is blank. Here is also blank. There are two blanks, for example, here. Then there's one more blank here. We are here. We are in state Q0. What should we do in order to add one? Well, the trick is that we are not, we have, uh, so here we are actually in a trick, in a situation we can do a trick because we have two two sided tape. It's infinite in both sides. So the harder way is, and maybe a bit more honest way, is to shift here and put the unit here. But we can also actually go here. So we can say that if you are in state Q0 and you observe a unit, then you have to. Maybe stay in the same state, keep this unit and go left. So this means that we can observe here, we can observe here or here, we have always go to the left. And finally, here if you observe the blank, then you change to your final state and replace it with the unit and do that. So this machine actually performs two steps. It just goes left and put the unit there. You can put right here, and what will happen? You will go to the right, and then you'll put the unit here, but you will stay here. You can make your machine also a bit more flexible by returning the head here. That means that you have not QF here, you will have some Q1, and this Q1 will move up to here until it reaches the blank, and when it's the blank, it should move back and put it QF. So Q0 is the initial state, QF is the final state, and you use Q1, Q2 is the, uh, is the middle state. N means the no move. No move, yeah. So again, uh, you could uh, insist on using uh, machines which always have to move, or programming these machines is harder, but they are still Turing complete. They do the same process. So the next uh, task is not that easy. Uh, it's a binary form. So I'll remove this. And I will say that there could be some zeros. And this is the smallest, and this is the biggest one. Okay? So it's from right to left, as usual. This is the units, the tools, the force. And the... Okay, so how do you add a unit in this form? Need to get to the rightmost character. Yes, yeah. you get to rightmost character. So again, we start with the same. Q zero. You observe a zero. You move to the right. The same with one. So now, when you perform these steps, you will get here. What should we do next? Yeah, one step to the left, and we, so if we are in state Q0, and we uh, observe the blank, so we reach the blank, you have to do Q0. Uh, no, well, this is the, you have a new state, so it should be Q1. 
Then you should leave this blank there and go left. So now we are here, but we know that we are in the last in the last step. And what happens next? If it's zero, it has to be one. If it's zero, it has to be one. But then what, what, what are we doing now? We're now adding the unit here. Yeah? So uh, if we're in state Q1 and we're observing zero, then what should we do? We should put should put one, but what state should we come to? Not Q1. Q1. Well, if you do Q, yeah, we can do Q final, yeah. And do no more. Because uh, this means that, well, we are not uh, obliged to return our head to the beginning of the tape. This is not allowed, we're not allowed but to do this. So if we reach it, if, there, if here there was zero, then uh, we just put one and we're done. So if our number ended with zero, we just replace it with one. But the interesting case, it was happens if we have encountered the unit. What should we do next? And what is the state? Q1. The same, yeah. No, it is the same Q1. So if it is one here, what should we do? We should um, put zero here. And move here, so it it going to do like this. So here we replace it with zero. We replace it with zero. Now our Q one points here, and we replace this with one, and we stop, and we get this one zero zero one one plus one equals one zero one zero zero. This is okay. Right? Is this all? No. No. Right to Q one and blank. Yeah. The, another one is the Q one and blank. And what should it do? Put one to write one. To write one if you have one. Yeah. It is only for the case if all of these are ones. Yeah. Then this is going one, 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 one. All will be replaced by zero. And here you should put one. Yeah. It's actually the same as this. And this is a, it should be like that because B is actually blank. It's the same as the zero, which is located here. There's one case when we have to add one more digit. And so this happens like that. Yeah. So this is done like this. Of course, if you wish, you can do uh, some uh, moving of the head after you are finished, just to locate it on the beginning of the screen. So by the way, these guys work independently from where we start. So we, if we started any meaning for meaningful cell, if we started a blank, you will do, it will do something bad. So if it starts at a blank here, it will just add the unit here. So this means it will not locate the actual input but it will just think that there is no input data. okay so these machines they do not check the input data for correctness so if you have some blanks in between so you have several numbers written on your tape or you have some strange symbols it, it can fail or it can do something strange so it's like programming that's and then it, it should be doing that like what you can all also add these of course in your, your realization okay so i think that what about next? So next uh, task is two. Um, I think that, uh, well, it requires some, I don't know, slow thinking about this, how it would work. So please do this at home. Uh, the ideas are basically the same. So you should move along the tape and check something, keeping finite information in your memory, in your finite memory. And uh, if you need to keep something infinite, you have to locate it somewhere on, the, on your tape and then return to the places where it is infinite. So this could be useful, for example, for uh, task 2C, which is not. So these languages are not uh, decidable by finite automata. You have to modify the tape in order to, to decide that. And finally, about the uh, P, which is a polynomial decidable class. So the, it's not all polynomial computable functions. The polynomial computable functions are called FP, function polynomial. P is the class of decision problems which are decidable in polynomial time. A decision problem means that we uh, start at some input data, but our uh, answer is always zero or one. 
So our answer is not uh, a number or something else, it's just binary. So this is the restriction. And why it's called decision problem? Well, for a good reason. For example, we have to decide whether a formula is satisfied. So the stat is a decision problem. The answer is just yes or no. We have to decide whether a graph has a Hamiltonian sign. So this is decision. Um, so uh, next, in the next lecture, we'll uh, discuss how to ask uh, questions. If we need to provide a satisfying assignment, what kind of problem is that? As a function? A uh, satisfying assignment. Uh, well, uh, just one. So, the, well, this is the non deterministic function, if you wish. So, uh, well, really, uh, the implementation is a function. It's a phenomenal computable function. And it solves a problem which is, uh, say, mm -hmm. multi map. So, but we're are going to discuss this a bit later in the lectures, how to use decision problem in order to solve function problems. Or, ah, this is called search problem. This particular one is called search problem. Find a, an object which satisfies some condition. And uh, there are polynomial in NP search problems that are reusable to NP decision problems, which we'll discuss next time. Okay. So these are for you to so two, three, and four are the home task. And we have 10 minutes left, uh, well, roughly 10 minutes, maybe. And uh, maybe we'll finish a bit earlier. So the five, six, and seven are questions about graphs. And we'll discuss a bit what a graph is. So um, in these questions, we consider only undirected graphs, so they don't have orientation. And uh, so a graph is, uh, uh, so yeah, and we are not allowing, I think by default, uh, parallel edges and loops. So what is a graph? So we're talking about graph for one, first because it is one of the interesting objects in discrete math, but we're talking about them from an algorithmical point of view. So graph, so we have, so this is vertex, this is edge. Vertices are somehow connected with edges. They could be isolated vertices. Uh, so um, parallel edges, things like that, are disallowed. A loop is also disallowed, but sometimes they use it. If you use this, it's called multigraph. And I think with this, you pseudograph, something like that. But you, usually people say like graph with loops and parallel edges. So sometimes they could be oriented, we are talking about non-oriented graphs, but at some point we'll also talk about oriented graphs. So in oriented graph, you will have arrows and you will have the beginning and end. And here in the unoriented graph, these guys are equal. So this is one end and this is the other. In oriented graphs, this is parallel. So this is parallel. But this is not parallel. They are, these, these guys are allowed. So you have, again, you have paths. Well, everyone knows what a path is. You just go along the road. You can see that the graph is a road or uh, is a set of roads or a set of, I don't know, acquaintances between people. And uh, this is graph. So, um, okay. Uh, what else we should know about the graph? We have edges, we have cycles, which are cyclic paths. In our edge case, you will have the probably arrows, of course. And the final thing you have to know by now is the degree of a vertex. So the degree is the number of edges which is connected to that in an unoriented graph. In an oriented, you have entry and exit. So here we have one, two, three, four. So this is four, this is zero, this is one, two, two, one. So this is degrees of the vertices. And the thing which people usually, the first thing which people prove when they um, uh, get acquainted with graphs is let's sum up all the vertices inside the graph. So we consider this, let me remove these loops. And uh, you will write it in a mathematical way, of course, for all of them. So the graph is G is a set of vertices and a set of edges, V. And let's consider the sum of all degrees. Okay. So this is the classical thing which people usually start with when they're talking about unoriented graphs. What is this? What did we calculate right now? 
two times the amount of acres? Yes. It's two times the number of acres. Because each edge was computed exactly two times for each edge. So, by the way, this is always even. It would not be odd. And uh, now let's see. For example, we have 5A. So what is going on to be here? Um, we have nine vertices of degree three plus 11 vertices of degree four plus 10 vertices of degree five. Can such a graph exist? No, no because this is odd. How do you understand that this is odd? Well, because this is odd, this is even, this is even. So sometimes this is formulated in another way, which is called the handshake theorem or handshake lemma. It's uh, when we consider the edges and handshakes between people. By the way, this is a multigraph because a pair of people could make many handshakes in their life. So the answer, the theorem is as follows, that the number of E or odd vertices in a graph is always even. So because uh, if you have an even vertex, then it gives an even addition to this sum. So if you take only odd vertices, then the number of them should be even, otherwise this sum would be odd, and it could not be equivalent to two multiplied by sum. It's called handshake lemma, but you can also use it just in this form, it's more understandable. Like this, and this is not, not a lemma, it's just a trivial remark. So next you have to see 5b and 5c. So beware, this condition of the parity is necessary, but of course it's not sufficient. So if you have a graph, and so not a graph, but you have a set of possible degrees. So for example, you cannot have a graph which has, if it's not a multigraph, you just don't have so many vertices to implement all your edges there. So this doesn't give enough. So therefore when you see 5b and 5c, you either have to provide just an example of such a graph or prove that it doesn't exist, maybe using this parity condition or maybe using something else. So, um, you just uh, usually just uh, first check this and then just start drawing and you understand. So, and the next two are going to be about the uh, Euler and Hamiltonian talk. So, uh, uh, there is a small difference in uh, definition and a big difference in the uh, algorithmic uh, properties of that. So a definition of uh, the Euler path is, uh, is saying that it uh, uh, comes through, through any two, um, from any edge one time, and there is a well-known Königsberg bridge question where I think all the boxes, so people who didn't see it you should do it. So it's, uh, uh, there is a city, and also there is a, well, not a formal <laughs> home assignment, but there is just a thing I usually ask people to try to do. Yeah, this is uh, the city of Königsberg, which was, um, which now Karenigrad in Russia was in Germany at that time. And uh, Leonard Euler, Euler, I took a walk, and there were the bridges like that, like that, like that, like that, like that. Like that and like that. And he asked the question could she visit each bridge exactly once? So there's a multigraph. The answer was, of course, no, because the degrees here is three, 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 five. How could you visit each um, bridge exactly once? Well, no way, because uh, you enter, then you exit, and the uh, parity forbids you from doing that. So the question for you is well, see the modern map of Kaliningrad and try to give the answer. So some of the bridges were demolished, some new bridges of course were built, Mo most of the bridges were built like this. They solved the problem by the way, not for cycle, but this Yeah, so this is the Euler problem and the Hamiltonian problem, you should visit each uh, vertex exactly once, and as we'll see that Euler path, checking for Euler path is polynomially decidable. So it's easily polynomially decidable to check for existence of such a path. The search problem, the search problem is uh, harder but also solvable. And maybe we'll discuss it next time. And for the Hamiltonian path problem, it's a big complex, even in the diffusion version. So small difference for this and big difference for the um, for the uh, problem.
Okay, so thanks a lot. Sorry for all these problems and see you next week. Lecture end of the seminar.